Margaret Cody. What First Nation are you from? Uh, Cody First Nation. Thank you. Margaret, could you tell us how people lived uh, a long time ago before a treaty, how they governed and how the leaders were picked? You know, just a general um, overview of that. As well, um, if you're comfortable to speak in your language, I would. Uh, it's okay to speak it or in English if you want. Well, in, in that area, what little I know is just from what I heard from oral history, things my father and grandfather talked about. Um, back then, it was uh, hereditary chiefs. Uh, a person was raised to be a leader because uh, they were going to become a chief. Like uh, the one that was a chief would raise one of their sons to take over being, being a chief. So they had specific training, I'm, which I'm not uh, knowledgeable about. How did the elders, um, the elder women, or did the women have a role in picking the elders, the leaders? There again, from what I heard, yeah, the women had a very important role in uh, not only uh, training the person that the people that were going to be leaders, that they they had um, uh, they had set up. Uh, like what the older women would say was was uh, was law. Like what they they the young people had to follow what the guidance was given to them by these these older ladies. How how did the women um, have a role? in uh, training the leaders. How did they do it? Uh, counseling them, giving them advice, telling them stories. Uh, a lot of our morals and values were taught uh, through story form. Like through the legends, there was a moral, a value, or a belief that was taught through, through legends and stories. Or the Atsu Keonan. The Atsu Keonan, I, I, I usually like to refer to them as ancestor stories instead of legends, ancestor stories. Because um, Atsu Kanak are spirits, ancestor spirits. Atsu Kanak, ancestor spirits, so their stories, Atsu Keonan, ancestor stories. Um, Nowadays, uh, the English terms, myths and legends, to me, it's like they're not true. Well, even if they're not, uh, they, they teach a truth. Especially when it deals with uh, our uh, main legendary hero that I don't want to mention the name because it's summertime. But uh, stories that have that character, um, even though a lot of them, those stories are like, you know, they're, they're uh, extreme, like, you know, s spiritual and supernatural things happen in those stories. But the main thing is they treat, they teach a truth or a value or or some kind of lesson. What kind of qualities did a leader have to have? They had to be uh, there for, for the entire community, not just for himself or his family. Yet, uh, he had to be a leader for the entire community. Uh, he, he had to do what was best for everyone.
there again, I'm not, I'm not really that knowledgeable in that part of the our history. But a lot of the values that were taught were. Uh, I'm going to be talking about that later. Uh, um, obedience, honesty, uh, sharing, etc. All those main main values. Did the how do you think that uh, these traditions and these values would help um, the leadership today? I think if our leadership went back to those values, we wouldn't have so, um, so many problems that we have in our communities. Do you see traditional governance in communities today? No. It would be nice if we can, if, uh, I think it would be nice if we can go back to uh, practicing more of those uh, traditional values in this, this day and age. Too many of the communities are following the uh, non-native way of governing. Like our communities, because of the election system, it just turns communities upside down every two, three years. And if there, if good people do get elected in, they just start they just uh, start to do good and then it's election time again <laughs> what were the changes that occurred with treaty signing um, well I seen there's been a change in uh, all three components of our culture, mainly the survival, like the survival, um, how people obtain uh, their food, their shelter, that has gone through a lot of changes. And uh, another component is the social, that's where a lot of change has occurred, especially with uh, the way the members of the community communicate with, through language, ceremonies. Um, at the time of the signing of the treaties, our language was in full use. Everyone in the community used it. And now, um, maybe only people that are 50, over 50 and not every, it's not that way with every community. People over 50 are the only ones that understand and speak the language in, and in some of the communities, not even that. So the language loss has been great, and with the loss of the language, there's also the loss of uh, the religious and spiritual beliefs, because uh, those were all conducted in the language, and the, the, the songs, and the dances. So that area has also gone through a lot of change. And the way, uh, yeah, the, the way a community uh, uh, govern themselves, like, see the, with the loss of the language, and the loss of the stories and the ceremonies, that's where uh, right and wrong were taught to the young people through 
in these ceremonies and in the stories and the legends. The morals, the values, the difference between right and wrong that was all taught through the language and the loss of the language, there's the loss of all that. And uh, the residential school had a great impact on the loss of uh, the language. Like Since the time of uh, the signing of the treaties, there's been, in my family anyway, there, there's eight generations. I have, uh, I'm, I'm the fifth generation. And I talk about from the time of the signing of the treaties, it, my great grandfather, Gabriel Cody was the first generation. And in his generation, there was 100% um, use of the language, the ceremonies and all that. And then um, my grandfather, Frank Cody, was generation two. Uh, no, his, uh, my great grandfather, Gabriel Joe, my grandfather, Frank, my dad, John, so I'm fifth generation, and I have children, are the, my children are the sixth, my grandchildren are the seventh, and I have two great-grandchildren, so that's eight generations. And my generation, my children are in their 30s and early, my uh, 41, 32 to 41, and they can understand, they understand some they understand uh, quite a bit of the language, but their generation hasn't used it. They haven't been using it. And so they haven't passed it on to my grandchildren. And uh, so maybe there's not even 5% usage. Words that seem to survive are slang and slang and swear words. To tell you the truth, it's only <laughs> in those generations, the the sixth and seventh, no one uses the language anymore to communicate. And if uh, nothing is done now in this generation, unfortunately our languages are going to be lost. They'll become extinct, which a lot of languages have already become extinct. There's no speakers left. I guess that's one of the reasons why I've stuck with my my work of teaching the, the language for 28 years. How did leadership and governance change after treaties? Well, when people were put on the reserve, then they, um, um, everyone had to follow the, the laws of the, the rest of society. They had to be governed by the, the, the laws they had to follow were those by the, by the police. That's one area I've never, I have never really uh, did any any studying about uh, governance and law. All I know is just the little bit I've been told, and that's not very much. How did the role of women change after treaties? I think uh, the way the leadership that the women had before the signing of the treaty was uh, the chief and council ended up having all the all the control or all the say about the, the communities. They didn't. They no longer seek the advice of 
elders and both male and female elders. There again, uh, it has to do with loss of language. If you look at the, I know my community, I don't think there is anyone on our chief and council that can, that even speaks our language anymore. So how are they going to seek advice of elders if they, uh, out, the elderly or the older people, the knowledgeable people, if they can't speak it. And I, th I think that's happening all over in a lot of communities. Most of the leadership nowadays don't um, understand or speak their native language, First Nations language. How did the people make a livelihood before trees? Off the land, hunting, fishing, trapping. Up until uh, my dad used to uh, hunt and trap in the north every winter, we used to uh, go live up there all winter. We used to live in a teepee in a tent all winter. Up until I was about seven years old, till I had to uh, start school. When I started s school, that's when my, my trips up north I came to an end. And I told, I was telling my grandchildren, I said, you, we used to live in a teepee in a tent. And Grandma, I don't get worse. Nobody can live like that in the winter. And I dug through my archives and I found pictures. We had old black and white pictures of uh, that teepee in that tent and there's snow all around. <laughs> and I showed them uh, uh, pictures of uh, our transportation with horses and wagon wagon in the summertime, a sleigh in the wintertime. And uh, my granddaughter, of course, grandma has to have picture proof. But you know, without the pictures, they would, they could have thought, they might, they might have thought I was just exaggerating. And that's the way the young people are today. When you try, tell them things about the past, they think you're stretching it or, or um, telling lies can't imagine uh, life without technology or electricity. We didn't have, we didn't have electricity till I was about uh, 12, 13 years old and that was just, uh, just the lights, no TV or anything like that. What is the understanding about the treaty promise for education? Well, I've always thought that uh, education is our treaty right. That uh, uh, the elders talk about uh, the Little Red Schoolhouse being one of the promises in the treaties and to me, the way I interpret that now is all the schools, all the colleges, the universities, that's the, the little red schoolhouse. You get this, it goes all the way. It represents uh, all levels of education. What about the treaty promise for health? The same with the, with the health. Uh, they promise the medicine chest and there again, uh, the, the medicine chest represents all forms of health care. What 
what teachings will help elders, um, leaders today? I have the teachings of the, the, the traditional values. If they can be brought, uh, brought into today's uh, this, today's uh, leadership. If they could apply that to their, to their leadership, all the, uh, the traditional values and beliefs. I think that would be a big help. How do you think they should be taught? Go right to the band office. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I don't know. I think the young people can be taught in, uh, more about the treaties and more about the, these things in the schools, in the, the First Nation schools and in our um, other educational institutions like uh, SIIT in the First Nations University. I know a lot of that is uh, part of the, is part of it already, but if that could be brought more to the, the community levels, I think it would be a big help. I once, uh, in 2001, I went and taught an off-campus class in my community it was a humanities class, has to deal with uh, stories and legends. And I was amazed. Out of the 17 students I had there, there were only three people that even heard about our main legendary character. <laughs> three out of the 17 students. So that's why um, uh, we developed that one class that just deals specifically with that. That We have one class that deals with that. Um, and we always teach it in the wintertime and it's in, conducted in English. But then in our degree program, we have other classes that deal with the oral tradition, stories and legends in the native language, in, our, in Soto and Cree. To me, I always, it always comes back to language loss because uh, uh, I know myself when, when I'm spoken to or being taught, being advised, or is a better word, being spoken to or advised by an elder, if I'm, if they speak to me in Soto, it has a, a way greater impact than if they tell, try to tell me the same thing in English. Because it's just the way our, our language is. You probably know that. <laughs> so going back to um, the livelihood before treaties, you mentioned that there was hunting and trapping. Did people trade with other tribes or with other people? Yeah, there was a lot of trading. Um, oh, besides that, uh, hunting, fishing, trapping, they, were, they used to uh, uh, pick berries and make their own uh, maple sugar and they picked their own medicines and they used to trade. I remember my, my dad used to tell me about uh, when he was a little boy, if my dad was living now, he'd have been, he'd be 97. He passed away 10 years ago. But he told me some stories about when he was uh, a little boy, they used to take three, four days to travel from Kamsak to Fort Capel, 
and my my grandfather Frank Cody used to trade medicines with um, Tony Sear up here. They'd come and spend they they'd come and spend a week or two up here and trade medicines and I don't know what else furs maybe. But that's one one story my dad talked about. It used to take uh, that many days to come over here with a um, team of horses in the wagon. <laughs> so what about the women? How did they make their livelihood? The same. They made all their all their clothes from the animals. Are you talking about before before the the, the fur traders and all that Hudson Bay came? Well, I, all I know is that the stories they tell that everything everything every form of livelihood came from the land. All the food, the shelter, the clothing was all done by the women. They did all the work to provide for for all for their families. And after the treaty signed, how did they make their livelihood? Well, from some of the stories I heard is uh, a lot of them went into fur trading and then uh, also uh, some of them went into farming. They were given uh, plows and oxen and a lot of them went into farming on the reserves. So if you wanted to say something to the young people that will be listening to your words uh, for this interview, what is it that you would like to say to them that will carry them into the future for the generations to come in terms of leadership? Go back to the traditional values and beliefs. Try to learn as much as you can about whatever uh, language background you come from, whether it's Cree, Soto, Nakoda, Dakota, Dene, or whatever your ancestral language is. Try to go back and learn as much as you can because that's where uh, I believe to really be strong First Nations people, we have to go back to our language and, and our belief system. Yeah. Some people say, oh, you can't go back to living in teepees and all that. That's not the component of the culture. Our, our survival that way, the physical, like the, the food, shelter, clothing, all that has changed forever. But the social and the... Uh, spiritual can all be brought back and practiced in this day and age. Because along with that comes our uh, traditional values and beliefs, our kinships and yeah, I, it's probably because I'm a language teacher why I, why I think we have to go back to the to the language to get back to, I don't think we'll ever totally get back to the way things were, but I think it would be a big help if uh, we had more people, more younger people learning to speak uh, our languages. How do you think that 
how do you think kinship is um, important when it comes to the language? Um, <clears throat> when we were, when I was little, we were not allowed to address uh, someone by name. We had to we had to say auntie, uncle, like you know, you know uh, uh, grandfather, grandmother, my cousin. We had to use the kinship. You miss so me. You wouldn't go up to if your uncle's your uncle's name was uh, Bill. You wouldn't go up to him and say Bill. You'd have to say uncle. <laughs> and um, I think um, there's more respect when you use kinship terms to address people. Or even this, my friend. And we had this kinship with all of creation. And when you have that kinship with uh, things from the land, then there's more respect. We refer to the sun as our grandfather, the moon as our grandmother, the earth as our mother, and uh, everything in creation, the grandfather trees, grandfather rocks, no. When you have a kinship with the land, then there's, there's more respect. The, you take care of it more, better. I guess that's it. So those kinship terms are very important, even in leadership. Yes, with the leaders too. They, if they would um, have that kinship with their fellow, with everyone, not just their the people they work with. What is the Soto word for um, chief? Ogimakan. There, a bit of history there. Um, prior to the signing of the treaties, they, our leaders were called Okima. Okima was a leader, a boss. And uh, after the election system, I often wondered why did they add that Khan on there? Okima Khan. That Khan has, uh, it, it means something fake, not real. Like, for example, a bear is makwa. Uh, a little bear is makuns. But a teddy bear is makuns Khan, a fake little bear. Or a clock, uh, we used to tell the time by the sun, kizis. So a clock is kisokan, a fake sun. So what does that tell you about Ogima Khan? They haven't, because of the election system, I think our people saw that they didn't have the, the same leadership or authority that the old chiefs who were called Ogima had. When they were elected, they were Ogima Khan. Fake chiefs. I know a lot of the um, chiefs are not going to like that term, but it's there, it exists, and it has that history of why it changed. You have the same term in Cree, eh? So that means that you have that suffix or that ending that means fake. There's a difference in the hereditary and the election. So that does affect leadership. I've often wondered why that, why that uh, ending was added to the word for chief. That alone says a lot. 